is Mr. Coates and this is Apes Lecture number 18 on fishing methods and impacts of those methods. Commercial fishing is a very large industry and uh, they have developed very large uh, nets and uh, methods, very large boats and things like that to catch fish. Uh, and so technology has gone a long way in helping us catch a lot of fish. And if you notice this is a big purse seine net here, it's just full of fish. Um, and so there's probably uh, several million fish in this net and so this boat can catch this many fish all in one haul and so uh, we're going to look at those methods and look at the environmental impacts of those methods. So the first one I'm going to talk about is gill nets. Now a gill net is a floating net and it's usually made from monofilament line. This is an example down here. Basically it entangles anything that gets in it and if you're watching any of those shows on Discovery where they're catching salmon uh, they're using gill nets there and basically the fish's head goes through the mesh and can't it can't get out because its gills get trapped in it that's what we call a gill net and um, so these nets flow in the surface they can be very long you could have up to a mile long gill net and they could be uh, anywhere from uh, four to uh, ten feet deep and so they just catch things indiscriminately and so one of the things that uh, we used to have here in Florida before uh, most of you were around, it was uh, the mullet fishery. Mullet are a uh, saltwater fish. They're a herbivore, so you can't catch them on hook and line. However, they do school. And uh, back in 1994, uh, the state of Florida as a whole voted to ban gill nets in this fishery. Prior to this time, gill nets were being used in this fishery, and they were catching all kinds of unnecessary bycatch things like redfish and snook and trout and they are really depleting those sport fisheries and uh, then in 1994 we voted to ban these nets in Florida waters and you cannot find any of these uh, gill nets uh, around at all the next kind is a drift net. A drift net is very similar to gill nets, however they are much larger. We can have uh, drift nets way up over a mile long. They're usually out in the open ocean usually they're left for months they have markers on each end of them where the uh, boats can find them again the problem with them is that once again they catch indiscriminately so here's a hammerhead right here that was caught it's probably going to be bycatch you see a bird right here that is caught in this net and so these are problems and because they're left alone for long periods of time a lot of times the fishermen will lose track of them and they can't find them anymore if a storm blows through or their markings are their GPS beacons or whatever can't find them then what we call they become what we call ghost nets and these ghost nets then float around the world's oceans just trapping fish all the time and but nobody's fishing them um, it's so bad that these nets have been outlawed internationally another type of gear is called a long line now long line is less uh, indiscriminate it's basically it's a long rope and once again the ropes can be very long 20 miles and along the rope every so often there is a baited hook line these lines will be left in the water maybe 24 to 48 hours that's the law here in florida uh, and it, basically anything you catch then uh, comes on board the ship and you take it off the hook and if you want it you keep it and if not you throw it back once again these are catch some bycatch you don't want here's another hammerhead once again turtles can be caught and uh, so there can be a problem uh, with uh, long lines as well. Uh, these are used here in Florida in the grouper fishery and also the red snapper fishery. One of the biggest nets is a, called a purse seine. Now this type of net actually encircles the entire school of the fish and then the bottom of the net is cinched closed like a purse uh, with purse strings. So this is how we fish for tuna. Now the, the purse seine, and this is an example one down here, if you notice it's a circle net and it has strings that cinch up the bottom right here and catch all the fish here and then you have boats that'll come in and drag the net in and so that's the kind of net that we saw at the beginning of the lecture with all those millions of fish in it and that's the problem with these is that they catch the whole school and they leave none behind to reproduce and uh, even though they're they're very efficient unfortunately uh, they they don't leave anything behind also in the past with the tuna fishery there is a problem with these nets catching dolphins as bycatch and for a long time the tuna industry just got away with this and killed these dolphins indiscriminately however Greenpeace uh, actually uh, infiltrated the tuna fishery 
and sent some spies aboard one of their boats one year and took all kinds of pictures of them killing these dolphins. And this created a worldwide outcry on the tuna fishery and virtually overnight people stopped buying tuna. And so the tuna fishery had to change their ways and so now all of the tuna here in the United States is caught and is certified by Game and Fish Commission or Fish and Wildlife uh, people that it, no dolphins were killed in the harvest of tuna so that they can no longer kill those dolphins. Another type of net is called a trawl net. Now a trawl net has a wide open mouth that is either held open by some kind of frame or they have some kind of uh, metal door that uh, basically forces the net open and then they drag it across the bottom and then all the uh, species they want to catch go up into the net and they're collected down here at what we call the cod end of the net. This is the type of net that is often used in shrimp fishing and all of our shrimp if we if you eat wild caught shrimp are probably caught in this type of net and uh, the problem with these is that uh, once again they're drug along the bottom so they can damage benthic habitats so entire benthic habitats have been wiped off the bottom because of these things in fact off of the east coast of florida where the oculina banks are which is a coral reef basically they have banned the use of trawls in a certain area because they are so destructive to those coral reefs. The other thing about these is that they drown turtles. A lot of times sea turtles will get caught in these and these are trawled for long periods of time, maybe an hour or two. And uh, if, you, if you're a turtle and you get caught one of these, then you could drown. Thankfully, the United States employed uh, this law. But all trawls in the, in the United States now have to have what we call turtle excluder devices so it's TEDS turtle excluder devices and so what it is it's some kind of device that's usually down here that uh, allows uh, escape hatch basically for turtles so it'll force all the turtles and large things down to this escape hatch whereas all the small stuff will go on through the, the cod end so this TED keeps turtles from getting drowned the last type of fishing I want to talk about is harpooning Harpooning is still used, especially in the whale industry. We don't, in the United States, we don't whale anymore, but other countries do, especially Japan and Norway. And, and so harpooning is used quite a lot in the whale fishery. A dolphin are also harpooned, especially in the Asian countries. This is a picture here of uh, hundreds of uh, dolphin that were killed for meat in, uh, for an Asian fishery. Uh, and once again, they are all uh, uh, harpooned when they are caught. Um, and then tuna. Tuna is also uh, one of those fish that you can catch with harpoons. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult catching and harpooning tuna uh, than it is whales and dolphins. Harpoons are still used quite uh, extensively in, especially in the Antarctic waters where Japan does a lot of uh, whale fishing. Now this gets me into an organization. This is the International Whaling Commission. The International Whaling Commission uh, was set aside to tackle the problem of whaling uh, worldwide and so basically they a volunteer organization and so your country can volunteer to join the International Whaling Commission and then therefore go by their rules which means no whaling and o only whales can be taken are uh, for scientific purposes so the US has joined that as well as several other countries Japan has also join that. However, Japan kind of hides behind the rules and Japan says that all their whales are taken for scientific purpose. However, they always take the maximum amount of whales every year and also it's been shown that whale meat can be found in their fish markets. And so Japan is hiding behind the rules of the IWC by harvesting whales even though uh, for uh, commercial purposes even though they're not supposed to. That's what this was supposed to do. It's supposed to ban harvesting of whales. Now once again this is a, a volunteer organization if you choose to, if your country decides that whaling is more important uh, to you then you can drop out of the International Whaling Commission and that's what Norway did a couple of years ago and Norway is back to fishing for whales again as well. We just talked about the world's commercial fisheries and one of the growing fields in fisheries now is aquaculture. Aquaculture is the captive raising of fish, our fish type products uh, and for sale commercially. So um, one of the uh, products you see a lot now in the market is farmed algae. In this case we have a special vessel here that is actually collecting kelp 
off of California and a kelp is actually used to uh, do all kinds of things. You can find kelp extracts in paints, you can find kelp extracts in toothpaste and puddings and gelatins and then people just eat kelp uh, by itself on salads sometimes or even in sushi. So kelp is becoming an important food source, an important commercial fishery, especially in Asia. All right, so when we talk about aquaculture, we're talking about farming the in, farming in the aquatic environment. Now, when we talk about mariculture, we're only talking about saltwater organisms. So we have a clam farm here. This is somewhere here in Florida where they have racks and racks of clams. And uh, these clams then grow up to a harvestable size. Um, they put cages around them to keep uh, predators away from the clams. And uh, this is obviously low tide. And when the tide comes in, it'll inundate these clams. And clams are filter feeders, so they help clean up the water as well. Now, aquaculture is a fast-growing field, growing three times faster than terrestrial farming right now. Um, and in 99, 3 million tons of fish and seafood were harvested uh, in the world. And so uh, that is uh, quite a lot of food uh, that is farmed in the world's oceans and uh, ponds and lakes. So let's look at aquaculture. If we look at this graph, we can see that the actual capture production, so this is commercial right here, is starting to level off. We're basically caught as many fish as we're going to catch over the years. However, in order to make up that gap, aquaculture now is basically uh, coming to the forefront. And so we want to look at pros of aquaculture and what are the cons of aquaculture. Now they said there are some problems with aquaculture. First of all is that it's not very efficient. Remember the rule of 10? If you have a fish farm and you have to buy food to feed these fish, uh, on average only about 10% of the energy in that food is going to be turned into uh, biomass that you can actually sell at market. The other 90% of the uh, fish food that you buy if you're a fish farmer goes to waste. And uh, so it means aquaculture is not very efficient, especially if you're buying food for your fish. The other point that's a problem is that um, because fish species in aquaculture are uh, crowded, they're packed in there, getting as many fish in your, air, in your pen as possible or in your farm as possible, uh, that if you have some kind of disease that, that uh, happens in your population, it can spread very rapidly. Remember, disease is a density-dependent factor, and uh, if you have a very dense population, that disease can spread very rapidly. Unfortunately for this fisherman, he found that out too late. He's in his fish pond here, and he is going through his fish after uh, a severe kind of disease wiped out most of his catch. And uh, unfortunately, he's probably not going to be able to market any of these fish. The other problems with aquaculture is that uh, it, because we're feeding these fish, we're feeding them a lot of food very often, then there's a lot of waste. And because of that, we can get algal blooms or phytoplankton blooms because of the excess nitrogen and phosphorus that comes out of uh, the fish. The other thing that can happen is that uh, if you have a fish uh, farm somewhere that fish it, that uh, raises non-native species, some of those species can escape and become invasives in uh, the natural environment. Uh, and we're starting to see this here in Florida with some of the cichlids that were raised as aquarium fish uh, and they're out in our lakes and rivers now. Um, in the Alifaya River, sometimes you can find armored catfish, or placostomos. Uh, and uh, these, these placostomos can um, take over the river, and uh, they were supposed to be a aquarium-only fish, and so it's becoming a huge problem there. The other thing is that a lot of times these fish are treated with all kinds of medications to ensure they're healthy. We talked about disease issues earlier. So if you're putting a bunch of antibiotics into your fish here, these fish don't eat all the food and their waste is full of these antibiotics. You're starting to create antibiotic resistance in the environment because after a while, the only bacteria left will be the ones that aren't affected by the medication. So this is a big issue as well is uh, do we uh, medicate the fish in, in our aquaculture settings? And then what impact does that medication have on humans when it comes to market? Well, I hope that was helpful in helping you understand uh, aquaculture and fisheries. If you have a question about these notes, please bring it to class and we'll talk about it.